Welcome to uh, Roads to Empowerment. Uh, thank you, Deborah. And thank you for all the uh, true agents of change that help bring this day forth. Um, they certainly do embody empowerment. They really do. So thank you to our partners and all those that are involved for making this day happen. Uh, it certainly seems to be a busy day today. And I really appreciate y'all um, declining your royal invitation and being here instead. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, you know, when I talk about embracing or embodying empowerment, it's not just the team that has put this together, but it's each one of you that are sitting in this room, okay? Um, I think it's really important for us to take a moment today and understand why we're here. We need to be here. Why are you here? Well, let me go ahead and explain why we, as a collective whole, are here. It's because there's a lot more work that needs to be done in moving forward and uh, breaking down uh, any kind of stereotypes um, and overcoming um, uh, mental health challenges. Um, in acknowledging uh, and bringing awareness to mental illness and mental health. And uh, every one of you in this room, I'm sure, including myself, and I'm pretty sure including those overseas, has had some kind of mental health challenge, mental illness, crisis, struggle, psychological pain, emotional pain that has affected their mental health, that has affected your life, or maybe you know somebody. Okay. But every one of you, I'm sure, can relate. Maybe some on different levels or to different extents, but including myself. We cannot afford to, do, to not do something. We can't afford to not do something. This is an issue. And I'm sure you all have watched the news. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about because you have been through things, okay? Or know your family or friends that have gone through things or you see the person on the sidewalk who's going through some things. We cannot, we cannot afford to just ignore it, okay? So here's an idea. How about be empowered? How about empower others? Be empowered and empower someone. That is the theme for today. There are many ways to do that. There are many ways and paths to cope and heal. There's more than one way. We're all different and unique. We have different preferences. Different things work for different folks. And that's okay. So the, the roads are boundless. And today at Passing Mental Health Day, we're gonna go ahead and have a glimpse into the different ways that you can be empowered. Empowerment. Uh, empowerment is power given to someone. It's the process of becoming stronger and more confident. That's empowerment. And you, you will find that, it, first of all, it comes in different forms. Okay, it looks, it, 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 it comes in different platforms. You're gonna find today, we, we have a dynamic, amazing keynote speaker, okay, that's gonna share on several ways in how to move forward in your road to empowerment. We have a, a, a wonderful panel of different authors. Yes, you can learn through literature you can cope through literature. Yes, you can cope through art. Okay. We have wonderful workshops. Uh, if some of you are interested in getting to know a real life experience, maybe you might feel motivated. There's something inside of you that's just wrestling and, and maybe you wanna make a difference. You've been through some things. You wanna make a difference? Go to NAMI in our own voice workshop. Maybe even talk to the NAMI San Gabriel, San Gabriel Valley and see if you can get involved. Maybe, just maybe, you could share your story if you would like. Or maybe just the idea of hearing someone share their story gives support, right? 
kind of gives a little bit of extra encouragement. Some of you who plan to have children or have children, mothers, fathers, partners, whoever, we got, let's talk about mental health, baby. Find, uh, learn the different things that you might need to know or consider when having children, okay? Or things that are important or helpful in giving your kids and families a better future or just protecting your own health, mama, okay? Why Mental Health Day? Because every one of us needs a mental health day, and mental health is every day. It's every day. It's no different from you drinking your water every day and taking your vitamins every day. It's no different from you to going to work every day or whatever it is that you find yourself doing every day. Mental health is an everyday activity. I am up here because I've been empowered. Believe me, I've had my share of mental tailspins and struggles, discouragement, heartache and pain, and I've been empowered by someone, a person who, persons, who took the time to encourage and have compassion. And you know what I found out? Those that have empowered me have been through something too. If there's anything that I recommend that you take away from today, it's not only being open to the experiences and learning different things and being able to allow these workshops or the people that you meet to empower you, to provide power, to empower you, to, 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 to continue in your road or to try something different or to maybe you know share it with someone. But I recommend that you take time to say hello and that you realize that the big, biggest resource, the best resource is people, people caring. That's the biggest resource. So let, let's, ta let's just take a moment and, or at least just, just take a little bit, do a little bit of an experiment and think, well, if I can, maybe I could use my own pain. How can I use my own pain or maybe my struggles or what I've overcome to help others? To help others in dealing with what, what they're dealing with today. Okay, but if there's anything that you take away, it's that you would understand that people, compassion, empathy, encouragement are the biggest resources. All right, just imagine what I like to experience, uh, crawling, not running, one, because I, I don't run and I don't like running, but that was a joke, but <laughs> crawling. Crawling a marathon on a broken leg. How many, of, how many of you have felt that way? There have been days, there have been really bad mental health days. There have been days where it's like, oh boy, how am I going to get through this one? Okay. Where, it, you know, sometimes it feels like maybe this marathon crawling feels like it's, you know, a lifetime. Just take that into consideration and know that at the end of the day, People are what matter in relationships. Yes, yes. You see, togetherness, connecting is powerful. Connecting with people is powerful. There is power in connectedness. There is power in coming together. And there is so much power doing so when there are struggles and challenges that have, uh, that have come up, that are being faced or dealt with. So I hope you discover the tools today, additional tools, hopefully. Uh, I hope that you are inspired. I hope you fill up those really cool resource bags with a lot of um, papers and phone numbers and, and so forth, and that you walk out of here motivated, but that you walk out of here comforted and encouraged that you are not alone. We are on this road to empowerment together and thank goodness for that. So.
what, my little thing just snapped off. So with that said, uh, I wanted to go ahead and introduce uh, the mayor of our city to share a very special proclamation for this very special day in honor of this really awesome month called Mental Health Awareness Month. Selena's impassioned comments, I think, uh, bring home how important this day and this activity is to our city. Uh, the poster that, um, that all of you have seen, presumably mine's all folded up, but um, captures it. it. It says, it exhorts us to join us as we gather together to raise awareness about mental illness, to decrease the stigma, and to increase knowledge and access to quality mental health services and resources in the community. There is, as, uh, as all of you know, um, lots of focus on mental health issues, most of it not very favorable. Uh, and most of it does not decrease stigma, it, in, it intensifies stigma associated with mental illness. So we have a tough road to hoe here. Um, I think when I reflect on what the city of Pasadena is trying to do, I, I look at what our various city departments are doing. Uh, the library, which is our host today, thank you, Michelle. Uh, our, our Pasadena Melf Mental Health Department, our, our health department, which has a significant mental health component. And interestingly, and, and some of you may not be aware, even the police department, which is not one that you would necessarily think would be making vast contributions to mental health. We have monthly reports from the police chief. Uh, and this month's report highlights the fact, and I'm reading directly from a piece I, I tore out <laughs> of his lengthy report. In May, 150 police officers attended mental health and awareness training to better understand the challenges of those suffering from mental health issues and enhance their de-escalation and communication skills. So I think that we should be encouraged that the police department felt that it was important to do specific continuing training for all of their officers so that they understand what some of the challenges are, uh, some of the mental health challenges uh, that people confront in our community. I'm encouraged by that, uh, and I think that you should be too. The Pasadena, our, our partners at the Pasadena Unified School District uh, are very much um, devoting resources, in spite of all their financial difficulties, to dealing with issues with our youth populations. There are two particular populations that I focus on in terms of mental health issues. Youth, our school children who have tremendous challenges and, and are dealing with them in a, in a variety of ways, and of course the homeless population. And so we, there's, there's very high visibility to this issue and all of us need to be tuned into this. But most of all in our city, I have to recognize all of the nonprofit agencies, all of the volunteer organizations that just work so hard to provide the mental health services, direct services to people who need them uh, that the city, frankly, is not in the position to do. We don't have the resources to do everything that needs to be done. This booklet that's outside lists some, not all, of the agencies that are engaged, and their, their full-time mission is to provide mental health services to people who need them in the community. So it's really with a great deal of pride that while I recognize what a big challenge we're all confronted with in Pasadena and how, how long the road is ahead of us to, to uh, achieve what we need to, I think that we can be proud of the efforts that some of you in this room are engaged in in terms of delivering services. And I wanted to express the city's gratitude to all of you for doing that, both on the public and the private side. And of yes, that's right. <laughs> and we do have, I mean, one of the things we do best at the city is develop uh, proclamations. Um, not, not too fancy, the county has much fancier ones, so really you want to get a county proclamation. Yeah, but, uh, but I would like to read this to you because it does capture um, the essence of what we're doing here today. The proclamation says, whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well-being, and addressing the mental health needs in Pasadena of children, youth, adults, seniors, and families is fundamental to having a healthy community. And whereas all people experience times of difficulty and stress in their lives, and with the prevalence of mental health conditions, 
in our nation, it is important for all members of the community to know the specific tools that exist which can be used to better handle challenges and protect one's health and well-being. And whereas prevention is an effective way to reduce the burden of mental health conditions and with early and effective treatment, individuals with mental health conditions can recover and lead full productive lives. And whereas it is appropriate to recognize the importance of improving the mental health of all of our residents, and Pasadena is committed to raising awareness about mental illness, promoting effective community partnerships and collaborations to serve the mental health needs of our community, and increasing access to culturally and linguistically appropriate mental health services. Now, therefore, I, Terry Tornick, Mayor of the City of Pasadena, on behalf of the City Council, to hereby proclaim May 19th, 2018, in Pasadena as Mental Health Day, and urge all citizens, businesses, organizations, and agencies to work collaboratively to reduce the stigma of mental illness and to increase the mental health of our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. I need to say one more time, it's so encouraging to see you all here. It's very encouraging and I hope that you take a moment to look around and be encouraged by what you see as well. Um, we're gonna move forth with our wonderful program with our keynote speaker. Um, this woman is quite fascinating. I have heard so much about her and so I'm really glad that the committee uh, and overall we're able to have her here to speak. You know, we uh, did a couple of meets, uh, mostly email, but there was something that just shined through. I mean, just transcended. And it was, her, it was just her big heart committed to serve and to empower, to make things, to help to make things better, but to help to get in touch with folks to build the confidence and to create more healing in their lives, more balance in their lives. But one thing especially stood out was she, she really emphasized the desire and the value to collaborate, teamwork, cohesion, togetherness. And I think that is just fine uh, in, in, um, in, in any individual, but especially those that are out there in the community and doing so much work to help others. Just welcoming. She wanted to hear from us. What do you guys uh, think? Oh, how empowering. Somebody asked somebody today, what do you think? What do you hope for? What do you dream about? Someone, any of you ask someone. You don't even have to know them, those questions. Thank you so much. I want to go ahead and uh, introduce our keynote speaker, N. Kim Indefo. Thank you, Selena. So I was thinking about the idea of the theme today, which is what roads to empowerment. Right? And a road implies that we're going, there's some kind of travel happening. Right? We're going to go on a journey. Right? So I invite you to go on this little short journey, I have a little time with you, to come on this journey with me. Okay? And we're going to start at the place many folks with mental health challenges start. And it starts with this question, what's wrong with me? Why is that the question that folks with mental health challenges start with? It's because the culture asks the question, what's wrong with you? Okay. The culture says, what's wrong with that person over there? And so we see that and we ask that question of ourselves. But when we travel down this road, what happens? This road is full of shame. What's wrong with me? Right? And if there's shame, then I want to hide. Okay? Then there's the pathology, right? Something, some, you know, get something is wrong. It's a brokenness, 
This is stigma. This is where the, the, the stigma flows from, these questions. What's wrong with you and what's wrong with me? Okay? And from that, systems of care sprout up. And these systems that populate this road reinforce this negativity. At best, they are dehumanizing. At worst, they are brutalizing. I don't want to travel down this road anymore. You with me? Can we do a new road? Do you see a fork in the road up ahead? I see a fork. And when I look at that other road, I see a different question, a different place to start. And this question is not what's wrong with you. It's what happened to you. What happened to you? So a group of people in the US started asking this question. People in various care providing in the human service field, medical, mental health, they started asking this question in the 1990s. And I'm going to tell you about one of them who asked this question. And his name was Vincent Felitti. Does anybody ever hear that name? All right, good. Let's go. Vincent Felitti is, a, is still a physician at Kaiser in San Diego. And he worked in a clinic for people that were very overweight. And it was a supervised medical weight loss program. And he noticed that sometimes people were very, very, actually quite often were very, very successful in losing weight, losing 100 pounds, 200 pounds, and then all of a sudden would gain back the weight very quickly. And so he started to ask, you know, this doesn't make any sense. You're here to lose weight. You're, you're successful. What's happening? And so he asked one person, and one woman told the story that she had lost weight, and um, suddenly, an older man in her workplace was propositioning her, which reminded her when she was younger, she was sexually assaulted by her grandfather. And she gained that weight back faster than you could even imagine. As he kept asking folks what happened, I mean, what was going on with them, they said sexual abuse, other kinds of childhood abuse came up and up and up. And he said, we were taught in medical school, this is really rare. What's happening here? And so he said, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm prejudicing by asking. So he had his staff ask, and he got the same frequency. So he went to, uh, he was at a conference in Florida, an obesity conference, and he said, I, I believe there's some kind of connection with obesity and childhood abuse. And they practically booed him off. They wouldn't, they, no, 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 this can't be true. But there was one person in the audience who said, I think, came up to him afterwards, I think you might have a point. His name was Robert Anda. He was with the Centers for Disease Control. And he said, I think you might be right. So the two of them talked about what would it take to prove it. And they said, a study, a very large study. And they did that. Okay. This study enrolled, I believe, 17,000, upwards of 17,000 people okay, in San Diego. And it asked 10 questions, 10 questions about childhood adversity or trauma. These questions were just yes, no questions. Did you have it? Not how many times? Just did this happen or did this not? Right? Were you physically abused? Right? Were you sexually abused? Did you witness violence in the home? Was there, um, were you neglected? Right? So these types of questions. And what they found astounded them. This trauma, this what happened to folks, you got a point for every time you answered yes. Okay? And they found that the more yeses you have, there was only 10, right? And these aren't possible, you know, every possible trauma that can happen. As the number started to climb, that the incidence of health problems, physical health problems, mental health problems, behavioral problems climbed accordingly. 
So they found one, these were called, they eventually were called ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, okay? That the more ACEs you had, the more problems you had in life. He also found ACEs were very common and his population was, they were primarily white, they were primarily employed, they had health insurance, so they had a lot of uh, resilience factors and they still showed this. I believe at this point 80 studies have been published from this data. We've never seen this kind of public health, uh, this association, this correlation so strong in public health data. And what Vincent Felitti said is he recognized that childhood adversity and trauma was the root cause of depression, of anxiety, for which people were using food to medicate. So the problem wasn't the weight, right? So the what's wrong with you, right? It's to what happened to you and how you're coping with it, right? If you're stuck in the what's wrong with you paradigm, you don't get to that question. And he so nicely says, we are asking, we're, fo you know, all of our, 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 much of our focus is on these downstream problems, these symptoms which are really people's best coping, like we're, for problems for which we never even asked the question, what happened to you, right? So this was a paradigm shift to start to recognize trauma. And he wasn't alone, there were other people, right? What was so interesting is he talks about having drawerfuls of letters of people, because this was a retrospective study, meaning people are older and they're remembering what happened when they were younger. Drawerfuls of letters from people saying, thank you for asking the question nobody has ever asked me. And something very interesting happened. They didn't do any treatment. They just asked the question. No treatment, just asking the question, right? These folks, didn't need to come to the emergency room so often. Their health got better. Okay. Stopping the stigmatization is powerful. Being validated and witnessed can be deeply healing in and of itself. Especially when it's someone to whom you've entrusted your care your medical care, your mental health care. I think that's an artificial separation because I don't know about you, but the same blood flows to my head and my body. Same thing. So there has been an explosion of research in the neurobiology of trauma, and we've learned how it affects virtually every system in our bodies. Our mental health is no different. I think you would be hard pressed to find any mental health condition to which there is not trauma beforehand. You would be very hard pressed. So as this movement, as we come down this road where we have these people starting to ask, not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you, what was born is a trauma-informed movement, okay? This trauma-informed movement is First in behavioral health, right? So this is mental health, but spreading to physical health care, spreading to schools, spreading all in, into law enforcement, corrections. And there's six principles, six basic principles of this trauma-informed perspective when we switch the question that we're asking. And I'd like to explore them a little bit because we think of them as the rules for this road, this road not the stigmatization road, we're taking the other road. And the first principle is safety. And it's safety, it's helping people feel physically and psychologically safe when engaging in systems of care. It's very important though, that we work to understand how people define safety for themselves. I can't define safety for somebody else, okay? The second group of principles is trust and transparency. That systems of care, we build trust among staff, 
in an organization and these caregiving systems with the individuals, the families, and the communities they serve. Conducting your operations with transparency. And that's something we want in all relationships. And of course, in relationships that are healing relationships. The next principle, peer support. I think of m many communities, and I think um, mental health, self-help, is one of the strongest examples of peer support and a model, really a model. That mutual self-help is essential. That it's not just the degree someone gets in school and all the letters after their name that makes somebody an expert. It is people's lived experiences that makes them an expert in themselves. I am also a clinician, among other things. And, um, but I always say I can be an expert in um, different treatment modalities. I can be an expert in um, connecting to resources. But I am never an expert in someone else's experience. So we meet on a level playing field. Okay. And that's the next principle, collaboration and mutuality. We level the, the, the power differential. So it's not power over, it's power with. Right? This is how we create collaborative relationships. So what Selena referred to is when I was asked to do the keynote, I asked, I hear the theme, but what does the planning committee What's important to you? What do you want to touch on? Okay. So that modeling this idea of this trauma-informed perspective is not just um, how we work with our clients or our patients, it's how we are in life. And I created an outline for this talk, and I sent it to them for feedback before I drafted it. Right? So, and that's what Selena was referring to. So this process of collaboration, where people feel heard and their perspectives are valued. Okay? It's also very transparent. The next principle people might not be so familiar with, it's cultural humility. Cultural humility. Sometimes we'll hear this word cultural competency, right? That you can be competent in, in cultures. There are so many cultures in this world, I don't think I'll ever be competent. Right? And that also de defines like it's like an end point that you get to this and then suddenly, oh, I'm done, I'm competent, I'm finished. <laughs> Cultural humility is taking an attitude that I don't know. I am humble, I don't know about your experience. Here, it levels also the playing field and the power differential. Right? Tell me about your experience. Okay? It's truly listening to people and also recognizing that no group is a monolith, right? So there's individuals. There's fam there's, you're an individual. You, your family might have a different culture. So even though you fit into this larger group, you might be more similar to someone in another group just based on the variation. So really being humble and meeting people in that open, open state. And the last set of principles is voice, choice, and self-agency. And I save this one for last because I think it dovetails with the theme of today. It's very important that we counter those folks, many folks have historically experienced a diminished choice and diminished voice. And that, I think, especially people with mental health challenges, absolutely. Where is your voice? Where is your choice? Systems have stripped that away. And so how do we put that back? right? And offer choice whenever possible. Create opportunities for shared decision making. Support people's right for autonomy. Even, maybe even more than empowerment. Empowerment is me giving power to you. What about you taking your own power? That's the self-agency, right? So this focus today 
on empowerment. Folks grabbing their own power is very fitting and very trauma-informed. All right, where's the next stop on this journey? That this trauma-informed movement really has prompted a, a move to holistic, person-centered approach that is really represented by today's event, right? We see holistic, we see expressive arts, writing and visual arts are represented here today. We see somatic or body-based practices in movement and mindfulness also present today, right? Because we're not just little he bobbleheads. I don't know if you watched that show, remember that show Futurama, the little head in a jar, the brain in a jar. We have bodies, right? Today, we have really an emphasis on raising awareness of the experiences of mental health and illness and challenges in all people, and especially being inclusive of those folks that are typically underrepresented, youth, mothers, right? So this trauma-informed movement that really is, this is like a little microcosm of it here today. If we think about it, as this has gained steam and spread out to other disciplines, it's really not a road anymore that we're on. We're now on a highway. And one of the things, as we added a lane here in this highway, was we added a resilience-informed perspective resilience-informed perspective. And resilience is about the bounce back, right? It's about the flexibility. It's not just, it's moving from the what's happened to you, and I think we'll all agree, what's happened to you is a better question than what's wrong with you, right? Can we do even better than what's happened to you? I think we can. The question for resilience-informed is, what's right with you? What's right with you? Right? This is a strengths-based approach. Right? This is looking at the factors within you and around you in your family, in your community, that are supportive, that move you in a positive direction. Because all of us made it here today. So no matter what happened to us, we must have some resilience factors so that we are all breathing, our hearts are beating, and we're sitting here today. And we need to acknowledge those. And I think this is extra stigma busting. So I think of Nami's work, amazing work around stigma busting, is part of this question, what's right with you? Right. So if we think about this highway, right? We've gone from a, down that really dark path, we saw the fork in the road, it's got a little wider. We've got extra lanes on it, right? The challenge, I think, here is that all of the things I've been talking about pretty much are an individual approach. It's all about the person. No one exists on an island, right? We are deeply affected by the things around us in positive and negative ways, right? So how can we move from this individual approach to a collective approach? To a collective approach. So it goes from this idea of what's wrong with us to what happened to us to what's right with us. And in this place, we can witness our histories, because our history is important. We can acknowledge our experiences, because they're important. We can validate our pain. But I don't know about you, but I am more than my pain. Go raise your hand, you're more than your pain? That's right. We are more than our pain. And we can celebrate our strengths and our successes. So I'm going to invite you to join me as we travel down on these many roads of individual and collective empowerment through not just today's events, but beyond. Thank you so much.
seeing Pasadena make mental health a priority. I think having the mayor make an appearance and have a proclamation is important. Even more important than the proclamation, though, was the examples. The examples of hearing that the police department is getting training in mental health, in de-escalation. That is the concrete action beyond the words. We have a variety of workshops offered to the public today. We have workshops for youth. We have workshops for adults. We have um, a couple of workshops that focus on uh, body movement because the body is connected to the mind. Mental health isn't just mental health. It also involves physical and emotional. In fact, our mental health does play a role in how we feel physically or emotionally and vice versa. So it's really important that we include some of those workshops. We also have workshops, um, a workshop that talks about uh, maternal and infant mental health, which is so important because mothers or those that are having children don't realize the importance of their own mental health um, that, that it plays on their children and families and what kind of future that they can set up for their child. We have NAMI in our own voice and that's such a great workshop where if you want to get to know a little bit more of a real life experience, we have folks from NAMI come in and they share their stories. They share their stories about how they've come to accept their mental illness and the things that they do to work through, uh, to cope uh, and and overcome challenges and especially to confront and overcome um, stereotypes, stigmas, you know, this, these, these uh, misinformed perceptions of mental illness. There are several ways to cope or heal from struggles and pain, mental illness, mental health challenges, and one of them is literature. I mean, it's wonderful that we have the opportunity to partner with the Passing of the Public Library for this event. And, uh, and uh, you know, we're surrounded by books, by rich knowledge. And really, that's one big way that we can actually uh, learn and get strong and confident in taking control of, you know, our lives or, you know, pursuing challenges or uh, working through negative experiences and so forth. With having this panel, what I was hoping hoping to bring to the community as an awareness of mental health and mental illness. I'm passionate about speaking out about it because I really think that the more that people talk about mental illness, the less stigma there will be. And people really do need to know that they're not alone because everybody is suffering from something that might not be a mental illness. But, um, but everybody has something and, and you shouldn't be ashamed about it. The committee actually selected the theme um, based off of last year's theme, which was uh, shattering the stigma. What we wanted to do was to inform the community about the stigma that surrounds mental um, illness and how it can prevent people from accessing service or even wanting to talk about it. So it's just going back to the basics. And this year, for those who attended last year, we wanted to do Roads to Empowerment because now they know what they need to do, but how can we empower them? So the panels that they're going to be attending, especially with the Youth Empowerment Corner, it's giving people the tools that they need to not only manage their mental health disorder, but also where can they get help. And also this year, the Passing Public Library got a grant to produce a mental health resource guide, which is the first of its kind, where inside the guide, it has all of the participants in our resource fair today and some additional resources. But we also want to talk more about um, what it is the library that what the library offers teens specifically. I think the f most important element is empathy. And you know, we're going back to basics. And I've been using that phrase a lot this past year. Compassion, empathy, encouragement. I think what's really Im most important to know is that there's not just one shoe that fits all, one size that fits all. And we have to really try to get an understanding of what's going on. Ask questions, listen, gather the information, see the person for the reality which they exist. And like I said, get a really true sense or understanding of what they're going through, what they want to share, maybe what they are expressing, uh, concern or requests, and just take time to have that empathy and compassion.